Uh, Mr. Speaker, as members of Parliament, especially at times like these, especially in a minority parliament, it's our foremost duty to work for the common good. I know I speak for all members of the government side when I congratulate you on your re-election, and I can assure you that on the government side, Mr. Speaker, we will do our utmost uh, to make your uh, sometimes very difficult job as easy as we can make it. The time where Canada has a minority government, Canada is facing an economic uh, turmoil. We need to have a cooperation more than ever. We need to have decorum. Uh, we need to have mutual respect. And uh, we count all on you uh, to help this House about that. But this is a responsibility to that we all share. And uh, you may count on the official opposition to do everything to be sure that Canadians will have the house they deserve. In a parliamentary democracy such as ours, the government must always be responsible and accountable through the people's representatives. Our government is mindful of both the privilege and the responsibility with which we have been entrusted. Canadians just uh, elected a minority government and their priority in this uh, tough economic times is to see their parliament work. It is also the priority of the official opposition, the Liberal Party. Mr. Speaker, just as Canadians are a people who have come from different and sometimes antagonistic backgrounds and yet have managed to create one of the most harmonious societies on earth, so we as their representatives should resolve to put aside clearly partisan considerations and try wherever possible to work cooperatively for the benefit of Canada. What this parliament does not need are government written manuals for committee chairs instructing them how to disrupt the work of vital parliamentary committees. Here, here. Here, here. What this parliament does not need is a government that attempts to manufacture confidence votes on bills that simply are not matters of confidence. Here, here. It is high time that the government actually unveiled the plan that will protect jobs, that will safeguard Canadians' pensions and savings. And it is high time that this government showed an ounce of fiscal responsibility. As the effective opposition across this country, Mr. Speaker, from the furthest points north and south and east and west of this great country, New Democrats will be demanding more of this government. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we will not be supporting this throne speech. The Prime Minister is the one who transformed a $13 billion surplus into a deficit. Will the Prime Minister admit that even though his government is ideologically conservative, it is certainly not fiscally conservative. Mr. Speaker, it is correct that the surplus is weaker than it was in the past because this government took deliberate action to provide long-term tax stimulus to the economy as the economy was slowing. That was the right fiscal decision and it was supported by Canadians. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker we, will, we will take additional fiscal stimulus as we agreed at the G20 if necessary. Mr. Speaker, anybody who would say that in the midst of a global uh, recession that they would, ref they would turn around and raise taxes or cut essential spending, that would be an ideological position that this government has no intention to follow. Well, Mr. Speaker, if he saw that coming, why then did he eliminate the contingency reserve? It doesn't make sense. First of all, we're going into deficit. Second, we are not going into deficit because of world or Canadian economic conditions. We are going into deficit because of actions, decisions made by this government. Will the Prime Minister tell us today in this House when he will bring forward action to assist the ailing auto sector here in Canada, put our people back to work, and fix the situation we're facing right now? The uh, right honourable Prime Minister. I have, to, I have to express a little bit of disappointment. When some in the opposition oppose even a broad statement of principle, I think that really speaks to just opposing for the sake of opposing. When will the Minister of Finance admit that having conceived these bad policies, he's responsible for fathering this conservative deficit. And as such, he has earned the title of Canada's new deficit daddy.
It, it, it is difficult, uh, Mr. Speaker, to, to take this sort of uh, suggestion from the, this particular uh, member. Under the Liberal government, spending grew an average of 8.3% annually over their last five years. In fact, in their last year, spending grew by 14.8%. Then they had these, these so-called surprise surpluses at the end of every year, which they would treat as if it were liberal money and not taxpayers' money. Every year with this March Madness spending, it's not surprising that they confused taxpayers' money with liberal party money, Mr. Speaker. It's happened before. The Bank of Canada has now confirmed that the likelihood of Canada being in recession is around the corner. And with consumer prices plummeting in the United States at record rates, deflation is also looming. Yesterday, however, the minister suggested that his economic statement coming next week will include no new stimulus action plan. At a time when we need real action, when will we hear and when will Canadians hear from the minister what his plan actually is? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Pe Mr. Speaker, surely it's, it's passing strange. One member gets up on the other side in the official opposition and says, you spend too much. The next member gets up and says, you're not spending enough. <laughs> You've got it. I know there's a team over there, Mr. Speaker. They're going to get together, their economic team, and talk about this and come up with a, with a theme and with some suggestions. When they do, and I mean this in a, in a cooperative way, I'd love to hear your suggestions about manner in which we can stimulate the economy. The G20 leaders and the G20 finance ministers agreed on that, Mr. Speaker. This is a serious situation, and we welcome your suggestions. Last time I checked, this was the government, and we need to hear from you what the action plan is. Mr. Speaker, many of the 160,000 lost jobs could have been avoided if only this government wasn't so stubborn in its refusal to act on, their be on workers' behalf. What is it, Mr. Speaker, about this government, these members, this Prime Minister, that makes it refuse to act to help families and workers when their jobs are in jeopardy. We have acted, of course. We acted well over a year ago. The cumulative effect in the economy is a 1.4% of GDP stimulus this year. Some of the provinces have joined us in reducing taxes on businesses. Next year, the stimulus in the economy will about 2%. To put that in context, that's among the highest in the G7 in terms of the stimulus we've already built in the economy. I'm sure the workers in St. Catharines and Oakville are very happy with that answer. Why is it and what is it about this government and what will it take to make it finally act to protect manufacturers, jobs and workers in this country, Mr. Speaker, where that, where that sector is even more... The Honourable Minister of Finance. Well, ge geography is important too, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in fact, St. Catharines elected, re-elected a Conservative member. <laughs> Oakville, the home of Ford Motor Company, elected a Conservative member. <laughs> and um, the good people of Oshawa re-elected a Conservative member. <laughs> Why, in the Prime Minister's own words, did the idea of a deficit go all the way from stupid to essential in just a few short weeks? They savagely attacked investments in literacy, women's equality, access to the courts and arts and culture programs, just to name a few. Now, after gutting Canada's fiscal security, the finance minister is about to introduce Canada's new conservative deficit. Canadians deserve to know. What kind of ideologically driven neoconservative cuts should vulnerable Canadians brace themselves for next? The Prime Minister contradicts himself on deficits. He contradicts himself on recessions as well. He said in September that if we were going to have a recession, it would have happened by now. Now he's forecasting what he calls a technical recession. So recessions that are technical, deficits that are structural, Mr. Speaker, recessions are not about semantics. They are about job losses, about Canadians who need help. Why doesn't the Prime Minister get it? 